Hey folks, how's it going? Some some really nice weather that we're having up here. I'm glad we got to have a, a trip to Vancouver at this time of the year. This is uh, absolutely beautiful. So what I wanted to talk with you about today was a little bit about our experiences in using OpenStack um, in the context of HPC operations, kind of from our perspective on, on the campus. I'm a um, software architect at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And we've had an OpenStack pilot environment in place uh, for a couple of years now, uh, along with storage. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but mostly about what we've uh, come to see in our, in our operations and where OpenStack is, is playing an increasing role, or we see it playing an increasing role. So if you're walking around campus today, um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of different conversations. You know, researchers have their active conversations around uh, discovering and publishing, educating, and, and reproducing uh, uh, their research. And that last one there is a, is a bit of a bear there. But I think there's a lot of potential in what we're talking about today in that context. There's al always the big data conversation, people talking about the, the data that's spilling out of their labs, off their laptops, and, and where, they, where they, can, they can put it, and where they compu can compute on it. Um, just the basic issues of moving data back and forth around campus and, and the complexities of having too much and not knowing where to stick it. Uh, the data security folks, they're um, always um, you know, really looking out for the interests of the university and of the, of the researchers. They've got um, the standard terminology of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And then, of course, there's me, um, and I'm just kind of in a little bit of panic mode. Um, one thing that's interesting that nobody talks about on campus is they don't talk about high performance computing and they don't talk about OpenStack. <laughs> That's me talking. The only time they talk about high performance computing is when there's a problem with not enough capacity. And the only time they talk about OpenStack is, you know, if I'm happen to corner them in the hall or something like that. Um, or just, you know, explain how, how much fun it is to work with. The or not, um, in some cases. But um, I think it's a little bit helpful to understand what our HPC community is, is like at UAB. We have um, a predominantly uh, biological science-based uh, HPC community. We've got a large school of medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The workflows for the biological sciences tend to be heavy in genomics and imaging. The, uh, that, you know, the next gen sequencing, that kind of um, large data analysis, the imaging that is going on. This used to be data analysis that would go on inside labs at the, at the various research uh, labs on campus. But we've moved from a period of where these workflows are experimental to where these workflows are really production and the experiment is how many times you can run them with these different parameters or how many different samples you can put through or how many images you can uh, compare against each other. And so now those kind of workflows have really moved beyond what the um, researchers can accomplish in their traditional um, server inside their lab. The, the, that data is also a little bit heavy of a footprint. That, that's kind of where the big data problem is, is felt on our campus, is in the images and the genetics and, and large data sets like that. So they can, they can use multiple cores, but they can't span multiple machines. So they, they, need, um, they don't necessarily need fancy networks. 10 gig is often um, easily enough. One gig can do if you don't have too much of a data staging wait time. The statistics folks, um, they run mostly short jobs. They're just kind of comparing different um, possibilities. Um, their jobs are, are very movable. You can run those things pretty much anywhere. They don't care what kind of networking they have pretty much because the data footprint's not heavy. There's not a lot of staging over their head. But we count those jobs in uh, their high volume. That's what they're, they're about. They're in the millions of uh, jobs per year. And then the, the final community that we have is the modeling community. These are the folks that run the, um, you know, either the molecular models or they model some sort of a mechanical device or um, uh, engineering device. And these models tend to uh, run on many cores across the HPC fabric. Um, they use MPI. They require InfiniBand. Um, they have um, uh, relatively light data requirements, so you could kind of stage them on another fabric if you have it, but um, they're uh, just really wide, so they're hard to get around um, in, uh, in different compute fabrics, and of course you have to have your special networking. They are, in fact, growing in memory requirements too, so that kind of restricts their motion further. So generally the experience of computing with clouds is a mixed bag. 
The modelers don't like me slowing down or suggesting that we slow down their uh, model runs with any kind of virtualization. Um, they're, they're interested in the cloud if, that, if they're like having a lot of work to do and they see it waiting a long time to get through the um, limited HPC resources we have on campus. Um, but then you know you say, okay, well, you're, let's get an InfiniBand cloud provision for you and start getting all the nodes that you need for your job. And, and you can quickly, when you look at the overall workflow that they're talking about doing, you can quickly run into the tens of thousands of dollars to run that complete experiment. And they often just, you know, just wait in the queue after that. Um, the biologists, they don't really care. They're like, you know, okay, well, if you think it's better. Um, they have a lot of new apps. They have deep dependencies on those apps. They oftentimes um, conflict with what we do in our HPC environment, and they have to then scale it to run multiple copies of these jobs. So they really do want um, their computations to run well, and they want a custom environment. So they're really primed for using the cloud. And then the statisticians, they, like I said, they don't really care. Their, their jobs, um, they're short often, not many um, hours, maybe four hours, two hours, and they can just be filled in wherever you can get them, and they'll pretty much uh, be happy as long as the forward progress is good on their, on their computation of their all workflow. So cloud computing is useful. Um, it's, a, it's a shame that we have idle cores in our fabric. That generally means like, you know, you're running electricity, you're running cooling, you're running your operations, but you're not doing anything with your computer. And so that you'd kind of want to avoid that scenario. So the container uh, model inside OpenStack is really ideal because what that allows us to do is really set up an environment that we can then transport with the job, an environment that looks like our HPC system for, in the most part, um, that's appropriate for the particular applications that are running, whether R or some sort of additional libraries. Uh, they also help us balance our, our load. Keep, you know, basically say, okay, well, we've got, you know, maybe some, a few large MPI jobs running through, but we can cover them up in nice little small jobs and keep the, keep the full system um, balanced. Um, the SMP jobs from the biologists, they're, they're kind of portable. They tend to be more portable locally um, because they have a larger data component. So if you're getting um, dropping down below a gig, really 10 gig if it's a big data set, then you're not really going to be able to move those around at all, uh, the, or let's say move them very far outside of your fabric. Uh, and then the MPI jobs, they, they don't really move at all unless you find another InfiniBand fabric. So, however, you, I think that the compute model is, is critical at this point. We, it's already been proven for our infrastructure, our ancillary services. We're using it for crash plan, GitLab, own cloud. I mean, those kind of services are, are important from a data reproducibility, the experimental reproducibility perspective. They're important from a data security perspective to be able to say, OK, well, we can instantiate an environment on another system. Um, then they're also good for just you know, our operation stuff. But the next big thing, really, that we're dealing with is, is science gateways. And again, this comes back to the, the biological sciences. A lot of biological scientists aren't necessarily HPC gurus. They don't want to focus on that. They want to focus on their science, naturally enough. And so they have um, the communities that they are a part of develop various web applications that allow them to interact with some uh, nicer interfaces. And then the web takes care of, the, or the application takes care of launching those jobs on a larger compute fabric in the background. We've been working with Galaxy for a number of years now. And it's got um, fairly decent um, front end requirements as far as web apps go. It's the, the depth of change and requirements and dependencies that it has inside of our HPC environment that really is the complexity of that tool. XNAT is going to be a similar experience that's where, that we're starting to, uh, to build up with our imaging community. So that kind of gives an overview of where we are on the compute front. Um, our storage environment, I, I guess I think of it as a little bit cleaner. Um, and a little bit more straightforward. Not that it doesn't have complexities, but we have a fairly traditional cluster environment of uh, home directories uh, on an NSF um, store, and then we have scratch space, whether it's shared across the cluster via uh, Lustre DDN fabric or locally for jobs that um, need to use a large um, footprint, like maybe with lots of small jobs, um, they can often run a whole lot better if you use your local disk space. 
We put into place, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we put into place a, a Ceph um, OpenStack solution for the past couple of years. And we've used that as our traditional OpenStack and uh, volume management kind of um, experience, but we've also kind of tapped into the back end of it to start exposing RBD containers into our HPC environment via an NFS gateway. And that's worked out really well. That's given us, um, our users, a way of basically we give them a, a, a sizable terabyte um, store to begin with. They all, everybody gets now a terabyte container that they can start to work with. If they need more, they can they can get more for their research group, and then it just kind of grows along with their needs. And that's been a very flexible experience. I mean, it's it's really worked out the way we intended. The only thing we really need to do is, is scale it up and update it. The the thing that I would really like to see from that, though, is a little bit more flexibility in how we can provision and access that. Right now, we have you know scripts that maintain this environment for the end user in kind of a pre-configured way, but I'd really like to see that be as demand-oriented as we have via our APIs and interfaces via the OpenStack dashboard and things of that nature, where the end user can say, hey, you know, I've got this... Um, I've got this uh, data set from this researcher that I'm about to process. I'm going to get some output, and I want to stick it in a container for them so that they can pick it up later. It doesn't account go against my account or in any way, and then I can uh, be done with it. I can ship it off to them. And that, that's really kind of hard to do. Right now, if I do that, I have to kind of work entirely inside of a cloud computing fabric from Dashboard and OpenStack, um, whereas if I work inside my um, uh, HPC environment, that's really where I want to be able to do all of this. So I know there's solutions there. It's just, it would be nice to see that a little bit more smooth and integrated, I guess. Um, so rather than just kind of forcing us to say, all right, we need to have an OpenStack container in order to have this context, there's a lot of utility in that, in that um, provisioning capability. So I like to think a lot in a simplified hardware profile. It just gets too hard to think about um, complicated things. And so I think of um, you know, pretty much what everybody sees as their data center. You have computers in racks. You have racks in rows. You have switches that connect all the stuff together. And in our particular environment, we have a subset of machines that have InfiniBand. So what makes this really um, useful is the network. The network is, has become the, the critical component to uh, bringing this into a, a useful environment. Um, overall, if we have a high throughput networking capacity in the core, we, we're dealing with 10 gigabit networking defaults now. Um, we still have some compute nodes that are one, one gigabit, but um, everything new is at 10. Uh, that pretty much gives us a, a, a common plane to work across of assumptions that we can make about what our hardware looks like. We'd like to use the same kind of interfacing to peer networks, um, whether it's Internet 2, whether it's uh, our campus network or some researcher's lab. And like, uh, you know, we don't want our equipment to be idle from, from jobs. We don't want to have jobs that could be running on a piece of equipment. We also don't want to have equipment sitting around that could be used in another capacity just because of where it happened to be provisioned in the data center right now. So if I have um, a large batch of data arriving, I'd really like to be able to say, okay, I need maybe two or three more data transfer nodes in, in my interface fabric for this network so that I can handle that capacity. Um, and of course, we can do it. It just takes some configuration. A little bit different than what we've done in the past. In case you haven't seen this, this is the science DMZ model that's really um, uh, the model of the day at the um, high performance computing environments on campus. It's basically um, across the top, if you just read the three components that run across the top, you have the in your wide area network, the internet, you have your uh, border router, and then you have in red um, on the right hand side the enterprise firewall and security fabric. And then traditionally, if you go down, uh, you, you have our cluster on that little cloud that's the site campus land cloud. And that is causing us some, some headaches because uh, pretty much our data transfers just you know, don't go anywhere. They, they just, compared to the size of the data sets that we have, when you're only getting um, you know, a few hundred megabits per second per TCP stream, um, you just can't you know, you're, you're, you're creating such a large overhead, especially when you consider the fact that our border um, fabric is at least 10 gigabit um, capacity. So you're really hurting the, the science experience when, when you put that in there. Um, or let's say when you remain behind that. And so what we're doing now is we're essentially building out um, an alternate pathway and putting in um, these uh, high performance data transfer nodes. 
uh, normally they run something like grid FTP or some other high um, throughput uh, data transfer uh, technology, and then they can you can move the data directly into the cluster either via some intermediate storage or into some uh, local cluster um, computing environment for the end user. So that's where our cluster um, hangs off of at the other end of the high performance computing fabric. And this is my very simple idealized system model what uh, I'm kind of uh, trying to work toward where you essentially have inside your research computing system, you essentially just have collections of nodes and networks. And you wire those things up in a, such a way that they serve whatever purpose you have, whether it's computing or data transfer in and out of the fabric. And I'd like to be able to, like I mentioned earlier, just, you know, widen that fabric that's coming in from the science DMZ or even from the campus or, or the research lab. I don't really want to have to say, oh, well, you know, I'd have to go buy another um, piece of hardware in order to make that happen when I know that I've got a, a fully capable 10 gigabit per second node sitting there idle, not doing anything for the next little while. So the neutron components are informative here. I have this up mainly just for, for reference purposes to, to highlight the, uh, the networks that are, are significant, the external network, data network, and management networks that you, know, have, to, you have to navigate around when working on these fabrics uh, and to reprovision them the way we want to. The, the key component, of course, is the new, neutron layer three agent uh, that allows us to route from the external and uh, um, network over to the data network. And then pretty much be comfortable running um, our KVM processes uh, inside of the um, border nodes as well in case there's some utility of having a, a custom environment for the data transfer uh, application. So this is a, just a, another picture of a generic neutron network that we can layer on top of this uh, um, hardware fabric. The public network is the internet or, or wherever you're coming from, but the important part about that is that the virtual routing capabilities inside of Neutron can you bring you into your tenant space, and that tenant space can reach from not just inside the virtual machine fabric, but also reach out to the end user's research lab, and we can start to offer them lots of services that they traditionally would have to run themselves because they're separate from a central service um, provider environment. For example, the, the DHCP, DNS mask um, services, those are a really easy win. I mean, researchers, they you might want to have their own lab, but they don't necessarily want to have their own infrastructure. So being able to make that um, transparent and easy between the virtual and the physical world is important. So from my perspective right now, Neutron is looking very good, at least the features that it's offered. I haven't, I haven't played with it in great detail, so I can't, other than knowing the configuration components, uh, can't stand up here and say, we did it, you know, 100, 100 gigabit per second throughput, whatever. Um, but uh, the, the important part about it is that it has all the features that we need to allow us to manage that virtual fabric in the, in the OpenStack space inside of our central um, data center HPC compute environment, and then also extend those features out um, down to the lab and allow the researchers to take advantage of that, the, the provisioning capabilities, the um, service capabilities, and just basically see that they have a lab that is in the entire environment. And then we can also go even further and use that to provision into our um, HPC uh, compute fabric. So when we have a new compute fabric that we bring on um, board, we can open up our tenant space for it and then run supporting services for that fabric as well off of the virtual um, fabric. I'm keenly interested into this distributed virtual router. So I'm going to be, I think there's a session after this one that I'm going to be going to to find out more on where they are on that. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. The, of course, the data transfer components, they can run on those border nodes. And just as easily as we can run grid FTP on that border fabric, we could run the, uh, the neutron layer three networking or other components that we would need to have for a functioning um, OpenStack network experience. So. Really, the, where we are right now is that um, adoption is, is kind of slow. Uh, it's, we've got the, the technology, I think, is really there for us to do a lot of this stuff. But um, where, where we get stuck is when we want to go implement it inside the, the, inside the data center, inside the or organization. When I, when I was thinking about this talk, I think we've pretty much gotten to where we are today, where, where I was expecting. Um, we had a... Uh, 
I was here last year talking about this um, uh, partnership that we did with Dell and Ink Tank, and that really got us, was great. It got us down the street really quickly. We got ahead, we had an open stack environment, we had a pilot um, fabric that we could play with and, and study and learn about. Um, but the, the next phase is really in, in our court, and it comes down to an organizational perspective and mindset culture ch um, shift that um, is much harder. So um, they, the, they're not wrong, these traditional methods of working, as much as sometimes I, you know, I, I look at the new technologies and I think, yeah, it's wonderful, um, but they're just established and they, they need to have a migration path over into this new um, environment. And, and by and large, folks are open to change, they just need, need help. Um, so um, I often promote um, user and control. That's one of the features that I really like about um, the, op the OpenStack environment, the cloud environment, pretty much letting the user drive their experience with technology. They need to be able to um, you know, go d down the street as far as they have to go or want to go or can go without having to call up people and get permission to do something and other things of that nature. But um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's okay, um, and it, it does exactly those kind of things, but you know, things will go wrong, and, and users will do something that they shouldn't have done, and they won't really understand that they did it, and they'll be saying, well, I don't know that I'm serving up that data set off of this machine. And so traditionally, when you have that kind of problem on campus, um, the network folks say, okay, well, maybe you don't, but I'm going to turn off your com uh, computer port and we're going to solve this problem until you, we can figure out exactly what's um, going on here. Because they want to be a you know, good citizen for the university. The university has liability issues if it shares data inappropriately. Um, they also, you know, if there's an exploit that's causing harm to other networks, they want to be able to shut that off. So um, they get the call, they remove the device, and um, they have final oversight on, on behalf of the university. Um, so they need to be able to pull the plug when things go wrong. And they can certainly still do it, but when they pull the plug to my entire cluster and HPC fabric, that causes a little bit more of an impact than when it's just um, you know one person running their new HP, um, scientific um, workflow app that they didn't realize needed a patch and therefore got exploited inside of our OpenStack environment that's leveraging the HPC fabric. So it's got, you know, there's a, there's a reason for it running where it is, but there's also a reason for the um, network, network folks wanting to cut off access. And so basically um, the, the, the APIs, the interfaces to um, OpenStack, of course, are, are the key. The, the Neutron interfaces allow us to go in and we can essentially should be able to identify what port that particular v VM is on and allow them to virtually unplug it um, in, in the way that would be the most effective way to stop that particular um, exploit or attack without doing harm to the other folks on that fabric. So. I want to essentially make sure that they have the confidence to operate the fabric and control it um, as much as they had before when it was a physical environment. Um, the security issues, uh, HIPAA, FISMA, and FERPA, you probably know those words. If you haven't heard them, they're you know, hospital, um, government, and uh, student. That's the, um, what they stand for. Uh, they don't have a lot to do with high performance computing except that they have a lot to do with research and education and so you just can't escape these um, uh, requirements uh, on the campus. They're, uh, you know, the traditional modeling environment or statistical environment, they didn't have any kind of personal, personally identifiable information inside those environments. So that was pretty easy. We got to say, well, it's not my business. But nowadays, people are bringing um, uh, data like genetic sequencing information. And while it's maybe clean, there's m many shades of gray when it comes to, to HIPAA. So everybody's looking at it, the, the Exceed folks, they're looking at it, the, the, the Exceed is a, a National Science Foundation network in the United States um, that essentially is building a fabric of large HPC centers across the country um, that are available to campuses to use. Uh, we're working on it too, we're obviously engaged with folks like the, the Exceed folks in the HPC community to, to build that. What's really helpful though, when you start to look at all these requirements for these um, uh, regulations, is the main thing that they 
really want to know is, you know, are you documenting what you do? Where are you logging stuff? And do you have an audit trail of the stuff that happened? And so being able to, when you go to construct these documents and address these requirements, being able to easily identify, you know, where is this stuff getting logged? How long are the logs held? What's the, um, what are the audit um, abilities of these logs to me, to allow me to show that, okay, well, on this day, you know, Joe user Y um, made this change in their networking configuration, and that's why we saw this device appear, and things of that nature, so I can backtrack and have some um, capability to, to adhere to the um, uh, audit requirements that come along with adhering to these different regulations. So having that come, come out of the OpenStack environment in a little bit more, I guess, ready state um, would be very helpful. Um, I, I realize that all of this stuff changes from site to site. These, are very, these can be very site-specific type of requirements, but they're also, um, uh, they have a generic layer to them that would be really helpful to have in place. So um, the, the other piece that I've just been starting to play with a little bit is the keystone component, the identity management. Um, I, in, my, in the past decade, I was heavily involved in um, the grid computing and uh, shibboleth identity management systems that were uh, essentially higher ed um, science, NSF-funded uh, projects to create identity contexts across organizations. And we, we built up this machine, um, I called it the MyBox box. It had essentially, the, it was a prototype for what IDM systems can be. <coughs> And it's been doing really well for me over the years, um, but it's aged and needs and needs repair or, and replacement. And as I've been, you know, having this kind of project running along the side and starting to study Keystone, I'm kind of looking at this and thinking, well, maybe Keystone here is a nice little component that I can bring into play in not a directly open stack um, context, but in an identity management context where I can, you know, maintain my user and um, group definitions and then associate the the roles that then my applications consume. Because when I look at what I built inside that original environment, that's pretty much what it was um, that, that we had. We had users and groups defined, and then we had roles associated with that that would be somehow consumed externally. So I hope to be able to, to, to pull that in um, into the rebuild. So um, going forward, uh, we have a new hardware fabric that we're deploying. Um, we've received some, some funding that we can go and rebuild some. And that's giving us an opportunity to uh, really take a fresh look across all of these services that we've been piloting over the past few years and really bring to, um, some of them into um, production mode. Giving us an opportunity to update our, update our open uh, stack fabric. I'm hoping that we can go with Kilo, um, but maybe at least Juno. Um, and then in my personal work, as far as you know, starting to play with the different OpenStack fabrics, both either at open, um, the local fabric we have or just a cl uh, commercial cloud fabric, uh, really starts to look a whole lot like business continuity uh, concerns. If I build, um, if I have my local infrastructure operating exactly like a public cloud infrastructure, or let's say reasonably exactly like my public cloud inf um, infrastructure where I provision similarly, um, I, I use similar tools and, and um, utilities to uh, bring my services online locally, uh, then I can turn around and say, all right, well, so you need um, a new MPI, um, InfiniBand um, workflow fabric for your model, I can, I'm provisioning this, this application environment for you locally on, on hardware, and maybe not in a virtual context. Um, I'm, I'm provisioning that locally. I know all the pieces that go into your environment. I can now just use the same collection of tools and provision it up at Azure or at Amazon or some other place where you're willing to um, pay whatever rates they have established for your, for your um, compatible um, hardware. And right now, uh, certainly I can do that today. I can, I can sit down. But if I have to do that in a way where I have to spend you know, a week rebuilding their environment in this little in special enclave called Amazon or um, Azure, then it's really n not very good for me. Also, if I have everything constructed locally, um, where if a disaster did happen, I could just instantiate it remotely, that would be a wonderful, uh, I guess, personal accomplishment. Um, but just some closing thoughts. Um, 
The, I think all the pieces that we need um, for HPC are, are here. Uh, there, there's obviously um, a lot of opportunity in being able to define uh, compute environments inside of OpenStack and leverage that for our different um, workflows, the ones that will, will travel nicely. Um, you know, we, we have large scale environments today. They seem very complicated, but ultimately, at least the way the history of computing has, has led us, we know that eventually this, this stuff will run on our wristwatch and be faster than anything we ever had inside of a huge room full of computers. And so these models are really the nice models to start working with and really building around because they're gonna, they're gonna be the ones that uh, are maintained forward in time. Um, and so, you know, this, these complex systems or these glues that we have are really just the way we build the computers today. And so when, when I think of OpenStack, I like to think of it as a glue and helping me construct the environment that I wanna build, whether that's for um, computing or for ancillary services or uh, research gateways or science DMZs. Um, but overall, it's, it's kind of like a BIOS that gives the, the user or the app a helping hand in, in um, accessing some of these uh, disk or compute or networking resources. So um, that's um, pretty much where we are today. Um, like I said, we've got some new hardware coming in that we're gonna be playing with um, a lot of this stuff in, in great more detail. Um, but I'd be happy to take any questions you might have or uh, comments that you wanna add. We don't, you, that's correct. Um, the question was about using InfiniBand and OpenStack. Um, and right now we treat it exclusively as an HPC resource. Um, that may change. Um, I, I think that it would be interesting to see. Um, I think Azure has an InfiniBand fabric that they provide for their um, uh, uh, cloud computing nodes. So I think it would be very interesting uh, to see if we could leverage InfiniBand in that kind of context, at least in a Nova Compute kind of um, context. But um, I haven't really looked at any um, other opportunities that exist for InfiniBand on, on the HPC side. So Adam Young, uh, Keystone Core, was glad to hear oh. the shout out from Keystone. Right. Um, couple points, one is that um, your OpenStack instance shouldn't own the user database. You should be consuming the federated identity from your, not just your university, but other universities, because you're going to have that. Absolutely. So um, don't manage users no. in Keystone. Manage um, the, the role assignments and stuff That's there. Right. Yeah, which absolutely. Is, yeah. I, I suspected that that was how you think about things, but <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure that everybody else here gets that message. That you do, <laughs> OpenStack does not own the user database. We consume them. Um, and then um, I would actually be really interested to hear what you were talking about with expanding the scope of Keystone beyond just OpenStack and what you were thinking with like using that in other, uh, other places. What did you really mean there? Well, it may be just naivete on my side um, in the sense that um, I see when I start reading the, the, the way Keystone behaves and I look at the way the um, custom IDM environment that I built behaves, they just behave the same way. So if I, if I consume my identities and plug them into Keystone. I would expect to have a shibboleth interface to my university like we yeah. do today. Um, so our, our identities flow over, allow for self-registration, allow for self-group assignment and affiliation through maybe some workflows or something like that. But to be able to use Keystone inside of, um, for example, consuming it from web apps and other right. things that I would run inside the OpenStack fabric, not necessarily just the OpenStack um, applications that help me run my- Authorization um, as a service. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so I don't know if that's the intent. Um, that I'll ask you here directly, um, so that's very convenient for me. But- It's um, which hat you're wearing, but I would like to be able to do that. I think we should be able to do that. And I would love to push towards that way. I think if we use that as a goal, it'll make Keystone better and everybody will benefit from it. So okay. um, there's a lot to do. I actually gave a talk on dynamic policy a little bit earlier today and I'd okay. be more than happy to talk through that with you. But okay. I think it addresses a lot of those types of issues and how do we get it, because you can't, you, the policy side is how you enforce it. So okay. you're consuming the roles that you assign in Keystone and then somebody has to make the decision. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do it. I think okay. we can push that way. All right, great, thank you. Right there.
Have, having the independent workers work under what? Ro okay. Okay, so you mean like instead of having like an, inf the question was around um, redundancy or um, uh, I guess duplication um, and, in, and the networking context with InfiniBand. And so I, if I understand correctly, you're asking, you know, why would we have or, or are we interested in having just a network that connects nodes versus a network that's used for MPI communication that connects nodes and then another network that would be used like a 10G network to traffic and other kinds of things. Well, so today what we have for our InfiniBand fabric is we use it for MPI and we use it for the Luster DDN fabric. So we do a little bit of um, that kind of dual use. Um, our focus on having kind of a generic network fabric plugging these things together, that might be, maybe it's a little bit of a um, convenience and maybe um, an ex uh, you know, a familiarity thing on my part in the sense that I know that I can go and reach inside a switch, assign my devices to different VLANs, and reprovision that particular node into a function across my fabric that has nothing to do with its traditional role as an MPI um, uh, node. And, and so maybe I'm looking at it more from that perspective. So from that perspective, I'm just kind of bringing it onto two fabrics where I can do one of two things with it. Maybe I could do that likewise, I could do that with InfiniBand. I'm not that experienced with the InfiniBand side outside of the use cases that we've had it um, applied to in our, in our environment. So I don't know if you wanted to follow up or if there's another comment related to that. Okay, uh, Blair yeah. from Monash University in Melbourne. Um, one of your points here mentioned uh, saying it's a shame to have idle CPU cores, basically. Mm -hmm. Have you guys actually got a solution for that that you use luckily? Or? You're just um, remarking on what you see. Well, I guess I'm remarking on what I see that it's a shame to have idle CPU cores. There are technologies that we've explored, um, like uh, Condor is one. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It happens to be pretty good at using up idle CPU cores um, and getting the whatever is using the idle CPU core out of the way when the local system wants it back. So solutions, I, I see those kind of problems largely being solved by a resource um, scheduler on the HPC side. So whether it's Slurm or, or Condor or something like that, what I want to be able to do on, from the OpenStackish side, if you will, is be able to instantiate a, a compute container on that node that's now running, let's say it's got three or let's say it's got 12 cores that are idle. I'd like to be able to instantiate a, um, uh, a Nova compute context, create an environment that looks just like my other compute nodes on my cluster, and then start to funnel jobs over there that uh, could potentially be computing and are waiting in our queue. And then if the underlying system wants the, those resources back, you know, evacuate real quick, get out of there. You know, even just a, a kill, if you will. Um, and Condor is pretty good at that. Uh, I mean, Condor is okay with a compute node disappearing. It just says, okay, well, I haven't heard from it. I'm going to rerun this job somewhere else. And so that's the kind of opportunistic um, backfilling that I'd like to be able to explore. So spot instances. I'm sorry? Spot, basically spot instances. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, I, I am. I'm not that familiar with ironic. I, I mean, I have it like in the back of my head. But yeah, it's definitely on the um, the the question was about using ironic for some of the um, MPI use cases, and it's definitely a, an opportunity there. But I haven't explored it. So there's another question at the mic. I think we might be down to the um, end of our session. So you mentioned what? Condor. Have you done any work to integrate Condor and OpenStack together? For example, someone runs a Condor submit that needs Ubuntu, so OpenStack goes off, provisions the machine, the job runs inside. Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at any, any integrations like that? Not integration like that. I mean, that's, what, that's what's on my mind. I've, I've worked with Condor in, in the ability to basically scale out jobs on different fabrics, whether it's the local compute fabric or Open Science Grid, but I haven't looked at um, triggering an instantiation of a particular environment for a, a job yet. So, but it's definitely a, I think, it, I think that reflects the kind of power that would be very, um, enticing uh, when you start to look at the kind of requirements that we have for different apps. So, um, 
I think that's all the time we have. And uh, so thank you very much.